Okay, let's get started. Elena, is there? Well, what a day it has been. Um, I, I won't get into the concluding remarks just yet, but you know, I'm still processing the enormous amount of inputs and reflections and you know, things that really um, sparked a lot of interesting thoughts. Uh, we started the day with uh, reflecting on the past and we thought we would you know, end the day thinking about where disaster studies need to go, what are the things that we need to think about, have on our horizon, the ways in which we have to do it. And so we thought, who better to do that for us than Elena Fidian Kasmier? We've talked about some of the things that Elena works on. Um, migration has come out. It's something that we start already seeing in disasters featuring prominently. But even more importantly, we've talked about today about working with southern academics, with southern networks. And um, Elena has done that brilliantly throughout her career. Um, so Elena, it's up to you to end the day on where we're going to go with disaster studies over the next 40 years, or maybe less than that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sada. Thank you for inviting me, obviously. And um, this was a very, very difficult remit to have. First of all, the final slot. So ho hopefully you're still all fully caffeinated. Um, so I'll try and um, keep things energetic and positive is what I was asked to do. So a little bit difficult, <laughs> given that we have been going through peaks and troughs in, in the day's presentations. And obviously we have to acknowledge the, the numerous difficulties and challenges from the very onset. But I've been asked to highlight um, the current state of disaster studies and where we would be moving forwards and the extent to which we're getting better at doing what we're doing. Now, some of the conversations today might have to temper that positivism a little bit, or positivity a little bit. Um, but what I'll try to do is I will highlight um, some of the key um, approaches which I think are, are working well in um, disaster studies and in the connection between academic research, policy and practice. I will refer to some key um, articles in disaster studies as I, as I do that. Um, that wasn't on my... Um, pitch, but I'll, I'll do it anyway. I will highlight some lessons learned, but I'll also highlight more potentially than lessons learned some alternative gazes that might be helpful in um, promoting the, the, the kind of subsequent moving forward that we need to do. Um, so in essence, as has already been said, in order to move forward, we need to keep on looking back and we need to ensure that we maintain that historical connectivity. We need to be sensitive to history and to geography in addition to identity um, and politics, as we've um, discussed earlier. So I'll, I'll discuss some of these um, points around study and um, practice and, and policy in combination rather than separating them out. And then I'll discuss three key themes that will invariably become um, increasingly important in disaster studies, um, primarily migration, forced to displacement and southern-led responses to, to disasters. So one of the key things that I think has really come through from academic research into policy and into funding um, agendas is the extent to which it's almost mainstream now to note that it is insufficient and inadequate to argue or to conceptualise disasters as unpredictable um, immediate urgencies, uh, emergencies that require immediate short-term emergency response. Um, and that we actually need to make sure that we're planning in advance because there are certain givens that we know in advance uh, and that we should be able to respond to those rather than having short-term humanitarian modes. So in essence, we need to be forward-looking rather than reactive and responses. responsive. We need to reduce risks, mitigate, um, plan and prevent. And we need to design longer-term um, elements into our immediate scale responses and this is one element that is also factored in very clearly into the GCRF um, programming as well. How can we look forward um, and respond in a more meaningful manner in that way? Now if we look back of course we see that this forward looking is not that new in many regards. The humanitarian to development continuum has been around for a long time. UNHCR's development assistance programs in the 1980s precisely attempted to implement that longer term response to immediate needs from the very onset. And indeed, if we look at other places in the world, we also see that this longer term um, programming has been part and parcel of many southern led responses to disasters and um, humanitarian situations. So without wanting to idealise those, we can see that um, different responses um, from communities, from states, from regional organisations in the global south, including those which have responded through the principles of south-south cooperation, have factored in elements of um, prevention and longer-term planning and capacity building since their um, very um, initial stages. 
So, for example, we will have read in the news that about 750 Cuban doctors left Cuba and travelled to um, the islands affected by the hurricane in, in the Caribbean. But in addition to those 750 doctors that Ilan and others have discussed through the lens of um, soft diplomacy or disaster diplomacy, etc., we can also see that Cuban-educated doctors were also providing assistance to people affected by this current hurricane. And that's because Cuba's um, long-standing um, education and medical internationalism had ensured that people who had been affected by the crises in the Central American and Caribbean region in the 1980s and 1990s had been offered educational medical training in Cuba in the 1990s, especially after Hurricane Mitch, um, to ensure that Cuban doctors would eventually become redundant and that there would be an element of self-sufficiency and self-reliance rather than depending upon externally arriving um, medical doctors. Now, we know that obviously this didn't quite work out for Cuba in some regards, given that Cuba itself um, had very sophisticated early warning mechanisms and yet lost 10, uh, at least 10 people in Havana as a result of, um, of the hurricane um, this past week. But what we did see was this forward planning, this identification of a need that was going to recur Hurricanes were going to happen again, rather than assuming that we would need to send in international doctors, what could actually be done, in this case through the Latin American School of Medicine in Havana, to ensure that Central American and Caribbean doctors would be trained to be able to support their own communities when the next hurricane arised, um, arrived. So we have local doctors trained through an intra-regional um, educational um, scheme, supposedly uh, ensuring the self-sufficiency of that community in the longer term. That also is an example not only of the longer-term planning implicit within cooperation mechanisms, perhaps another framework that is helpful to overcome the binary between the development and the humanitarian nexus, or however we want to, to discuss it. Um, so in addition to that, there's the element of who is actually the humanitarian community um, that we are, we are discussing. So there is not just one individual international humanitarian community. There are various communities of response, and there are different states of response and communities on the local level of response as well. So we have to increasingly recognise, and research is helping us do this, increasingly recognise that in addition to the UN and the, the highly um, institutionalised mechanisms that we often refer to and often identify as the audience of the policy environment that we want to be influencing, there are other communities which are getting on with work in different ways and different geographies with different ethos of work, and that we need to interrogate how these different actors are um, conceptualised, labelled, welcomed, rejected, etc., in different ways. And um, HPG's um, um, project, A Global History of Humanitarian Action, was precisely attempting to do that, identify that the international humanitarian principles have a historical root, which is geographically um, situated, and that there are other alternative modes of responding, of conceptualising um, humanitarian response, which may not be labelled humanitarian, but are nonetheless key responses to disasters and to displacement scenarios for example. So in my um, recent and ongoing work, I've been looking at South-South humanitarian responses to conflict-induced displacement. I'm currently looking at the situation in Syria in terms of how Southern actors are providing assistance to people displaced from Syria and Lebanon, Jordan and Turkey. But in the past, I've worked with um, Cuba and Cuban-educated um, doctors who have been trained to um, provide self-sufficiency in, in their refugee camps and in their countries of origin. And I'll come back to that a little bit later on. But just for now, just to acknowledge the importance of history and of geography, of thinking about different um, locations or origin points of assistance mechanisms, different ethos of, of response, etc., in these contexts. And geography is important not just in terms of where we turn our gaze and where assistance might be provided from in the context of southern-led responses, for example, but geography is also significant in, in terms of the scales of response. And again, disasters and um, disaster studies have been um, incredibly important in highlighting the importance of multi-scalar and multi-stakeholder um, multi responses. So we know that we need to continue examining not just which individual stakeholders are responding in different ways, but also what the roles and responsibilities are and the relationships are between those different um, actors which are responding. We've mentioned most of these today, although not all as far as I've, I've heard. So we have at least to consider the relationships between individuals, households, communities, subnational actors, including municipalities and municipal actors, national actors, regional organisations in the Global South and international organisations which may or may not be affiliated with the UN.
And there are interconnections and responsibilities across time and space in these contexts, and they are processes. They are relationships that change over time, and that therefore we do require ongoing research into um, identifying how these relationships are changing. Now, the importance of multiscalar research um, is obviously highlighted in, in numerous um, pieces in, in disasters, including in Sara Pantuliano, um, Elena Davy, and Joel Kina Kainahan's introduction to the virtual special issue on resilience, but also for one of our colleagues over here who was interested in the relationship between conflict studies and disaster studies, there is an early view paper um, available on, on the disasters website by Simon Hollis, who is specifically looking at that relationship between IR, conflict studies, and disaster studies in an attempt to um, bridge that gap and really think about the, the national and regional level actors in particular. So the importance of multi-scalar analysis also obviously feeds into um, the different changes which are taking place in modes of operation and also in funding of response mechanisms. So there's an increasing trend for identifying and acknowledging national and regional aspects of disaster management. Now, again, we can say this isn't particularly new, um, and we've had so many examples throughout the day that that evidences that we are all fully aware of the roles that are played by governments and by regional organisations, etc. But in particular, when we have transboundary and also regional disasters or crises, these elements and these scales of response are very important. Now, the long-standing history has in part been overshadowed by the emergence of the localization agenda as a pivotal agenda, which is parad you know, changing paradigms, etc. Um, and we now have the international community um, stating an aim, even if not fulfilling this um, in, in particularly consistent ways, of supporting national and regional actors in the global south. Now, when I was trying to find how are we doing things better, and could I find some good examples of this actually being put into practice, we can see that the 3RP in the Syria context is identified as putting that theory into policy and practice. So the World um, Disasters Report in 2015 documents the increased tendency to support nationally-led um, strategically um, strategic responses to disasters worldwide. And the UN's Syria Regional Refugee and Resilience Plan, the 3RP, has in particular been presented as a paradigm shift. If you type in 3RP paradigm shift, your web page will be inundated with references. So that is definitely the buzzword which is associated with the 3RP. A historical analysis analysis would be useful to actually unpick the extent to which this is paradigmatic. You know, this is actually a paradigm shift or not. But one of the key elements that is presented as being particularly innovative about the 3RP is the extent to which this is um, a nationally led, regionally coherent strategy built on the national response plans of the countries in the region. And it's also particularly important, it's presented, because in line with the longer term planning that I've just referred to now, the 3RP, I quote, aims to combine humanitarian assistance with development and resilience of host countries from the onset. So again, we could say, well, maybe very new or maybe not, but at least it's in there as a key um, policy priority. And amongst other things, it also centralises the importance of municipal level authorities. So again, it's indicating that um, one has to work with national and regional organisations, but also with municipal actors to promote not only positive outcomes for refugees, but also for host communities. And that is, again, a return to some of the debates in the 1970s within refugee studies, which were arguing that we did need to consider not just refugees, but people affected by displacement, which would include also host communities. So that was one example that identified as at least bringing those theory elements into the, the policy domain and the stated objectives of the international community to support this multi-scalar response, which is led by nation states, which are directly affected by the crisis through multi-year funding, which we've already heard is also particularly important. Appropriate funding hasn't been provided. This has, this has been a limited operation in many regards, um, largely because of, of funding, but also for other political reasons. But we do know that regional, national, and municipal level actions and coordination are key. And indeed, we also know that municipal level policies can challenge and overshadow and overcome some of the limitations of national level policies as well. So when we're thinking about the localization debate, um, it's very important to consider, well, what's, th what's the local unit that's being um, adopted or used by different um, organizations by the UN, etc. It's typically nation state and regional organization. Sometimes it's municipality. I would like us to go more local in the localization debate and really acknowledge the roles that are played by local communities um, um, themselves and also on neighbourhoods alongside other actors. So it's, I think, important to take that 
possible example of the 3RP and to consider the interconnecting multi-scalar elements of the regional, national, sub-national municipal authorities, communities, etc., as not only being affected by displacement but also as responding to displacement in different ways. And that includes acknowledging communities and individuals not just as experiencing but also as responding to displacement. And um, I'll come back to that theme again um, a little bit later on. So what we do know is disaster studies has and will continue to play a key role in bringing insights into these different scales and these different stakeholder groups which are responding um, and both in identifying the positives but also in the challenges in those contexts. Um, the next scale that I, or the next um, theme that I think comes through, especially when we're thinking through community and individual household level um, elements but also um, other scalar questions, is the increased acknowledgement that we need to reconcile immediately responding to mass emergency experiences and needs with attention, uh, attention to intersectionality. And by intersectionality, I refer to the importance of identity markers, which combine, intersect, male, female, might, might intersect with sexuality, ethnicity, religion, disability status, HIV status, etc. So it's not simply you are a female, but you are a female Muslim who has been internally displaced and has a three-year-old child and has particular nutritional needs, etc., etc. So those different identity markers intersect. But that, uh, those intersections are also important in terms of the structures of oppression and of opportunity that arise. So you may have particular opportunities as a result of the identity markers which you identify with or which other people identify with you. Those structures might include sexism, Islamophobia, um, xenophobia, etc. Um, and we need to consider the extent to which those different identity markers and those different structures of opportunity and um, of oppression can actually influence experiences and needs on the ground and need to be factored into emergency level mass scale responses. Now, when I made this suggestion to um, a group of colleagues from the UN in Geneva last year, hands were raised and said, oh, that's very nice in theory, but you have a mass group of people and you need to provide assistance, so you can't take into consideration individual identity markers and structures of opportunity and oppression. And I said, well, actually, you can, and the UN, in some sectors, is quite good at doing this. So a very simple, if you know, basic example is UNFPA um, identifying the extent to which identity is significant in defining what is a basic need and what can lead to dignity in context of, of displacement and of disaster. So in the Indian um, Ocean tsunami, for example, which hit communities early in the morning, Muslim women were not wearing the veil when the tsunami hit. And when disaster um, relief packages were delivered in the public sphere, these women could not, in dignity, go and access the um, assistance packages. So UNFPA from very early on identified a veil as being an integral item for a dignity pack. Mm -hmm. So the very definition of what is um, a, a basic need or um, something that has to go in a dignity pack is not simply saying, oh, well, there will be women and therefore we should include sanitary pa um, pads, which is already an advancement in many different regards because that has not always been the case, evidently. But it's saying these are women with particular identities and beliefs which they hold very dearly to themselves and it's not just staying alive, it's living lives in dignity and accessing aid in dignity. I'll have a little bit of water just now. There we go. So intersectionality is very important, and it's also very important for us to build on the knowledge that we have already obviously accrued in terms of the advancements that we've had in understanding the significance of gender in research, but um, in, in disaster research. But we also need to go beyond the gender equals women um, equation. This is very central to my work on gender and forced migration. And indeed, it has also been argued in a recent piece by um, JC, I believe, um, Beyond Men and Women, or is it another? It is, yes, wonderful. Um, so identifying the extent to which gender minority issues is also very important in disaster contexts. We need to consider sexuality. We need to discuss, as John Twigg has um, disability issues, we need to discuss age, we need to discuss religion and ethnicity as identity markers which are significant um, and um, which also influence the extent to which a mass response will be limited and will not be efficient if we are not considering who the people are who require assistance um, and who deserve um, the, the attention to their individual needs rather than being seen as masses. <coughs> 
And the intersectionalist and multi-scalar response, which is forward-looking, must also move beyond the rhetoric and the policies framed around empowerment and promoting agency, and rather identify the barriers that are preventing people from being able to act upon their own solutions, to be able to actually make informed decisions and act upon those decisions to find their own um, ways of coping and negotiating and resisting different contexts in which they are, they are living. So rather than empowering people, there has to be that need or that recognition of finding ways to lift the barriers that prevent people from living and dying in dignity, again echoing the concerns that many people have raised today of the importance of, of dying in, in dignity in, in contexts of disasters and displacement. So this is a key theme, obviously, throughout disaster studies. As we've heard, disasters aren't natural. Vulnerability to the disasters isn't natural or inherent, but is heightened by structural factors and by inequalities. And intersectionality, I think, as a lens can help us with this kind of analysis because different barriers and different opportunities prevent or enable people differently. Some people may benefit from particular disaster situations, as we know from the war economy um, approach, for example, developed by and um, espoused by um, Keane and others. So we also need to think about the barriers which prevent states from responding as well. So I've discussed some of the elements relating to individual and community level responses. But if we think about those structural factors, different states have different barriers to being able to act on the information or the knowledge that they have. And here again, I go, I go back to that earlier comment relating to we have the knowledge, we now need to make sure that that's put into practice. Well, what are some of the structural elements that prevent people and states from putting those elements into practice? And again, there's a poignant reminder from Joete um, 2014 article in Disasters on Catastrophe Modelling and Loss Calculations in Small Caribbean States Vulnerable to Natural um, Catastrophes, which argues that what we need is more efficient local governance. Well, how can local governance actually be efficient when there are structural impediments, including for those states which are British overseas territories, which have been affected by Hurricane Irma and um, Jose and, oh, you know, unfortunately also in the future by, um, by Katia in, in, um, in the Caribbean. So how do we consider the structural inequalities that prevent that knowledge from being put into practice? And maybe that is one of the other areas that requires more research. How can knowledge be translated, be um, implemented in conditions of precariousness and in conditions of inequality and structural um, discrimination in, in many contexts? So in summarising that first part of my presentation, I'll just note that in spite of our ongoing challenges, we are not as a community of scholars and practitioners, I would argue, but as members of diverse communities and diverse networks which may or may not identify with the international humanitarian community, but we those diverse intersecting or non-intersecting molecules um, are getting better at looking back we are being more attentive, I think, to history. We're better at looking elsewhere. We're better at identifying good practice examples from across the, the global south, for example, and also examples that transcend or critique the international definitions of what humanitarian response might actually look like. And we're also getting better at looking through different lenses. And this comes back to many of the questions or many of the points raised throughout the day relating to interdisciplinarity. And studies of disasters, um, such as those showcased in the Disasters Journal, are multidimensional, multiscalar, interdisciplinary, and are engaged in the dual imperative of research, which is one of the key terms um, espoused by Landau and Jacobson in their article in Disasters in 2003. That need for research not only to be in conversation with policy and practice, but also to work together to ensure that the world does indeed continue progressively to get better at anticipating, managing and responding to disasters. And that includes questions relating to messaging, communication, different platforms, etc. Now, I had a whole page on the GCRF and interdisciplinarity, so I'm glad that this is now only half a page, having had a, an earlier discussion on this. But these underlying principles of disasters, of interdisciplinarity, of multiscalar analysis, of the dual imperative, are also um, strategically mainstreamed within the GCRF um, um, agenda, within the UK Research Council's remit to encourage innovative ways, creative ways of addressing some of the world's major problems and, and challenges. Now, I must flag that I am a member of the AHRC's um, GCRF Strategic Advisory Board, and one of my projects, Refugee Hosts, was retrospectively funded under the GCRF um, scheme. So I will, you know, put that semi-hat on, and I'll take it off occasionally as well. 
that um, there are obviously some concerns. Some people have raised concerns around the extent to which the GCRF actually redesignates ODA funding away from operational um, elements towards research. But we could also potentially argue that this is one way of ensuring that we are continually doing better in terms of um, addressing the, um, the issues that are underlying why we haven't resolved the questions that we've been exploring since the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s. If we have those answers, why hasn't there been a significant change across the board? And that's potentially one of the, the innovative um, features of the GCRF, etc. So the GCRF um, identifies interdisciplinarity as being key in um, identifying new questions and new potential solutions um, for, um, for these different challenges. And in the UK context, it does indeed ask us to um, explore key global challenges, disasters across the board, um, in addition to other questions, through um, interdisciplinary work and by working with um, and finding ways of communicating and sharing with different um, partners, etc., now, there are two points that I, that I have here to, to discuss. One is the discussion that we had earlier relating to partnerships and how we can ensure that these are meaningful rather than extractive and abusive. Um, the GCRF and the AHRC, ESRC, which is funding um, our project, and I'm the PI and Alistair is, is one of the other um, co-eyes on the project, etc., is to actually acknowledge that the AHRC and ESRC was very um, open and very supportive in terms of working with local researchers, not just local researchers who are in research institutions in Lebanon, Jordan and Turkey where we're working, but with individuals whose research trajectories have been interrupted by displacement and by conflict. So we are working with Syrians, Palestinians, Palestinians, um, Iraqis, etc., who, um, whose research trajectories have been affected by conflict and by, by displacement, in addition to host members who have also been um, affected by, by these um, situations in these processes. So that has been much more straightforward, for example, than another research project that I have funded under the U European Research Council, in which I spent the first nine months um, after getting the grant trying to get the computer to say, yes, I could work with local researchers in an equitable manner, rather than paying on an extractive basis. So I could employ people as data field collectors, but I could not employ people as local field workers and local researchers who would co-author pieces with me, would co-analyze the data, etc. We just couldn't quite get over that bureaucratic hurdle and it took nine months to do so whereas with the GCRF there is a model of working with and it's still in development and equitable you know fair payment etc and, and acknowledgement of, of local partners um, can sometimes be problematic but there was that openness and that readiness which I think has, has is, is very beneficial and we have to continue pushing the research councils to ensure that we can work with local researchers and be led by local researchers um, through support from um, from the research councils etc so having said that, the second point that I had relating to the, the GCRF is also echoing some of the concerns that um, some of the former editors of um, Disaster has shared with Ian when he was conducting his research for the, um, for the paper that he presented this morning. And those are concerns relating to the technical and math mathematical bias in the field and um, suggesting that there is that need for the future interdisciplinarity and the reaching out to the social elements of, of disasters more, more actively. And my question is... In the, in the context of the GCRF, for example, is there a role for the arts and humanities in disasters, not just instrumentally to be able to secure a grant by ticking the interdisciplinary box, or by seasoning a social science or a medical science um, research project, um, to, which would effectively continue to be a political science or a social science project, but you pepper it with some nice photo analysis or some poetry analysis, etc., just to bring the project to life, etc. Is there a way of going beyond instrumentalization and also beyond seasoning to actually view interdisciplinarity as a way of reconfiguring what we think we know and also how we can think more creatively about implementing um, that, that reconfigured knowledge? And in the edited collection um, by um, Eleanor Davy and um, Kim Scriven on the roles of historical and archival analysis, um, they argue that historical um, approaches are not only invaluable as providing instances of lessons learned, but are also invaluable because of the alternative lens and the alternative research skills which are highlighted through historical and archival research. These are alternative to those people who don't already mainstream archival and historical research into their 
analysis, evidently. Um, but they argue that the historical lens can provide histori um, critical questioning of humanitarian practitioners and policymakers in a valuable way, which actually makes one a um, more adventurous and holistic approach to innovation, a more reflective um, uh, attitude to research and to policy and practice beyond simply using it for lessons learned. So within a context of the journal such as Disasters, is there a space not just for historically sensitive analysis, but also to explore the roles of the arts, not just as means of implementing disaster response more efficiently, as some research would, um, would suggest in terms of arts being a key part of trauma relief, but as um, a potential way to document and resist mainstream ways of thinking about responding and representing disasters and displacement to an audience in a way that will actually improve the way that we think and we respond to, to displacement. So that's a question. Is there a space for the arts, not just um, um, history, for example, um, in, in these research processes and these um, engagements with policy and practitioners? So with that all in mind, I'm now going to turn on to my three themes. Um, I will try and get through them quickly so that we have time for breathing in my context um, and for discussion afterwards. So the key themes that um, uh, Sada flagged for me and which are very much in line with my own interests are migration, forced displacement and southern led responses. So perhaps counterintuitively um, for a presentation pertaining to key themes in disaster studies, I'm going to start by noting a key th um, trend in encouraging commentators, analysts and practitioners to challenge the use, misuse and abuse of the labels disaster and crisis when describing migration related phenomenon. So we know that since 2015 in the European sphere, for example, the rhetoric of disasters and crisis has led to the implementation of surveillance control mechanisms, policies which are in violation of human rights and which cause crises rather than responding to them. The crisis mentality, which is also used by humanitarian um, organisations, ostensibly to secure humanitarian donations and compassion, have risked um, increasing despondency, fear and hostility. So the crisis rhetoric can be very counterproductive and um, dangerous in many different ways. Um, another element of, of course, historically and um, geographically situated analyses have argued that the representation of a migration crisis um, can easily be debunked by, um, through this historical analysis. So, for example, um, Heinde Haas reminds us that circa 3% of the world's population since the 1960s has been migrating. That is, of course, proportional and the population of the world has increased, but the proportion remains um, broadly um, stable, meaning that 97% of the world's population do not migrate. We know that refugees only represent between 7 and 8% of the um, global migrant population, and we know that about 86-87% of all refugees in the world remain in the global south, and over 25% of those remain in le the least developed countries. That evidently indicates that geographically, the main area um, which has remained understudied for num a number of reasons, and yet will become an increasingly important trend, is south-south migration. And that is really where our attention needs to be, um, needs to be focused in the years to come. As a theme, um, which does not mean that we should identify um, a causal relationship between um, disasters and migration um, for, num for numerous reasons. Um, Sada had asked me to discuss migration in relation to climate change. This isn't my area um, specifically, but clearly we do know that migration may or may not be a key role in people's um, decisions and actions um, following to climate-related phenomenon and processes in their localities. Climate change will not cause migration, and we don't need to, and we must not depoliticize the reasons why people do or do not migrate and the ways in which they are responding to the changes that are invariably taking place in many different environments around the world. So to take um, Ilan um, Kalman's article, um, his title, no change from climate change is, is possibly one way of framing this. It's not climate change which is causing migration, um, but there are also other contexts in which the non-determinism is, is the key factor which has to be mainstreamed within research. Um, that's to say that we do not know if migration will or will not result from XYZ disaster at what scale, at least. So I'll bring some examples from disasters which suggest this. So um, Bimal Paul's 2005 evidence against disaster-induced migration indicates disasters do not always create out-migration. That's drawing on the 2004 tornado in north-central um, Bangladesh. Sebak Kumar Saha, in discussing Cyclone Isla, indicates all households wanted to avoid migration, but it was an inability to return to livelihood strategies which existed beforehand, which meant that they had to migrate to a neighbouring town. 
Um, we know that attitudes towards relocation following Hurricane Sandy through um, Buvich and, and Owen's 2016 um, piece indicated people's reluctance to move. The, de the desire to stay. We all know that local result, uh, responses to hurricanes, Irma and Jose, have been characterised by people being reluctant to leave for numerous reasons. So we have a lot of evidence which suggests people don't want to move unless it's completely necessary, or movement is a completely normal and um, reasonable feature and everyday life experience for people, including, for example, um, in a recent article by Lauren Carruth on kinship nomadism and humanitarian aid amongst Somalis and Ethiopians, where we see, in, in Ethiopia, sorry, in which we see that movement and mobility may be an everyday feature of life. And it may, in fact, be the interruption of the ability to move in particular areas, which can be an indication of vulnerability and crisis. And again, colleagues such as Laura Hammond, who've worked with um, pastoralists and nomadic populations, either themselves or, or historically, indicates this tension between how we identify when movement and migration is an indicator of stress versus a, a, an everyday livelihood um, strategy and activity. But what I would say is that although we have this tension between migration is often resisted, movement is often resisted, versus movement is normal, and reasonable and every day, um, to say that what we can, I believe, assume to be a key trend in um, what we need to be studying and what we need to be responding to is the extent to being, uh, is to the extent to which not being able to move, being stuck behind border walls, enforced um, safe zones, as in the case of Syria and elsewhere, that inability to move can be indicative of crisis. And yet well, there are only three articles in Disasters which have the word immobility in it um, from, what, uh, from my search of the archive. Um, and I think that immobility will become a key theme and a key concern um, for, for research in, in the few years to come. Forced displacement. So we have immobility, which I think is a, um, intimately related with forced displacement. We often have more attention to international displacement because that's when it becomes of concern to international communities. But obviously, um, immobility and internal displacement are um, just as significant, if not more so. So here I just wanted, again, to draw out some of the key f um, features within disasters which help us understand key trends in contemporary forced displacement. And here I identify urban displacement and protracted displacement, but also a recent focus of my work has been on overlapping displacement. And that's something that, again, brings us back to that notion of forward-looking planning, etc. So in her introduction to the special issue on refugees and the displaced, Sada Banduliano draws our attention to the significance of Robert Chambers' 1979 piece um, to help us situate the urban turn in displacement studies by reminding us, to quote Sada, that too much attention was being paid to refugees in urban areas in the late 1970s. So this led Robert Chambers to identify the importance of focusing on the differential experiences and needs of rural versus urban um, refugees. Um, but what we can see in an operational sense is that when UNHCR has come up with the, the programme title Adapting to an urban, urban World, it's not that refugees are newly adapting to urban settings, it's that it as an organisation is finding it challenging to operate in that particular sphere. So um, even though it's a return to an urban model, there is a reluctance and a difficulty in operational terms, um, terms of actually upholding the needs and rights of people in those spaces. So both Sada and um, Robert Chamber have highlighted the need of um, focusing on the heterogeneous needs of refugees and of displaced people around the world, and also focusing on the different spaces of arrival and settlement, whether they are camp, rural, urban, and everything in between. But we also, I think, need to focus more on the relationships and the interactions between different members of um, the same refugee community and different members of different refugee communities who are sharing those spaces through what I would refer to as refugee-refugee relationality. A lot of research has focused on the relationship between refugees and aid providers or between refugees and citizens but there has been comparatively less done on refugee refugee relations and how we can actually think about how those change over time and space and there is also relatively less research on the relationship between refugees and hosts in different contexts and again that's one of the key foci of our AHRC um, ESRC funded project refugee hosts which Alastair Ager is, is also um, one of the co-eyes on um, so what does it mean to have 
urban and protracted refugee situations taking place at the same time. People are sharing space and what we have, what we can discuss is overlapping displacement. So in a place like Turkey, cities have over 37 different nationalities of refugees living side by side. And yet we don't really understand how those relations um, actually um, uh, come, into, come into play. And as people share those spaces for generation after generation, it becomes increasingly important to factor in longer term planning and programming into humanitarian response um, since, as John Twigg noted in his introduction to the disasters virtual um, issue on recovery, the old simplistic notions of disasters as a temporary interruption in development and recovery as a return to pre-disaster normality are clearly no longer viable. And this is especially the case because vulnerability in a displacement situation um, often increases after displacement rather than decreasing, as Veronique um, Barbalet and others at HPG has been, have been highlighting in their research. And indeed, that the return to normality is often not going to arise for people who themselves personally or their families experience crisis after crisis after crisis. And in this context, it might be a matter of identifying how people can manage disequilibrium on a longer term <coughs> rather than attempting to recover to a normal situation, um, whatever that was, and um, that becomes the key priority for policymakers and for practitioners. So in one of the examples that we're exploring in the Refugee Host Project, we're looking at how established Palestinian refugees who um, were expelled and displaced in the 1950s have become host to refugees from Syria in Badawi refugee camp. These are refugees hosting refugees and the relationships and the different operational responses to them with UNHCR and UNRWA operating in the same space with different hierarchies of worth and of assistance being provided makes it a very um, difficult space to, to live in and, to, and to, to work in, etc. And it becomes even more complicated when we realise that um, in, uh, a few years ago, refugees from a neighbouring Palestinian camp were internally displaced to Badawi, and those refugees who became internally displaced people and then um, became established host residents within Badawi camp are now hosting refugees from Syria. So they are refugees who became internally displaced people who became hosts to newly displaced people from Syria. There are overlapping experiences of international and um, um, internal displacement and experiences of hosting that also require analysis. Um, hosting by refugees and of refugees, hosting by internally displaced people of refugees, rather than always emphasising the extent to which citizens are um, providing assistance or are being affected by displacement, etc. And I know I'm going a little bit over now, aren't I? So what I would identify is that refugee-refugee um, relations and refugee-refugee humanitarianism, which is one of the um, elements that I've, that I've been focusing on, are examples of southern-led responses to displacement. Individuals, families, households, communities, regional organisations and states from across the global south respond on a daily basis, and they will continue to do so, and they have done so for decades and centuries. And this acknowledgement of the role played by southern-led institutions has been highlighted through the localisation agenda which I mentioned earlier and although we might be concerned around the instrumentalization of southern actors um, and the ways in which northern um, states may simply be implementing um, programs to be able to withdraw their responsibility and their um, obligations towards different people without actually sharing funds and resources those concerns may bear in mind but that acknowledgement of the roles played by southern led actors is nonetheless a very important step to take um, not least of which because it helps us overcome some of the suspicions that have often and prevailed in terms of the assumption that southern-led actors are more corrupt, more partial, and less humanitarian than those organisations and actors which are leading uh, responses from the global north. So we can find again in disasters um, an example of lessons that can be learnt from southern responses for northern actors in Wamsler and Lawson's 2002 article, which identifies some of the weaknesses in northern-led resilience strategies precisely by comparing them with southern-led, community-led responses um, across the global south to disasters. But in addition to those lessons learned and the element of um, not so horizontal learning from the south to the north, there are alternative modes of response um, which can at times work with or at times challenge directly normative no northern-led responses. And here it's not just a matter of actors from the global south providing responses, but also the opportunity that arises to consider the role of south-south cooperation in um, disaster response, um, which I think is particularly um, important at this context. And what perfect timing, I know you did this on purpose, yesterday, 12th of September, was UN International Day for South-South Cooperation. So this offers us a particularly important time, I think, to reflect on the extent to which the principles of South-South Cooperation, which have been so clearly identified as being important 
important to development could also be carried through to disaster uh, response and to displacement. Because indeed, there is a long history of South-South cooperation over disaster relief. I've already mentioned Cuba's involvement in Central America and the Caribbean, etc. But there has until recently been resistance, um, both by Southern actors and by international organizations such as UNHCR, to um, consider the role that South-South cooperation can play in disaster response when there is a conflict involved, when there is political involvement in which the state, far from having that lovely bond of responsibility with the citizen, when the state is actually um, implicitly or explicitly involved in violating human rights um, and, for example, in causing internal displacement or, um, or external displacement. So some people have argued that the South-South principles of non-interference in um, other member states and the respect for um, state sovereignty mean that it is impossible for a southern state to become involved in conflict-induced responses. And also um, organisations such as UNHCR have often argued that South-South cooperation is not possible because you need a long lead-in time to be able to develop relationships to be able to provide response. So while UNDP has been fostering South-South cooperation as a key part of its work, um, UNHCR has until recently really not thought about this in, in much depth and has argued that because disasters, displacement are immediate, problems that require immediate responses, you can't build in South-South cooperation into your organisational responses. I think that is one of the key challenges that arises at this time. We need to think about the role that South-South cooperation can play in contexts in which we know that the key trends of displacement are protracted displacement. We know that there is the lead-in time to be able to develop relationships. We know that um, states such as Cuba um, have been providing scholarships for refugee youth, including Palestinians, Sahrawis, Namibians and South Sudanese from the 1970s to to the, to the present, which mean that Syrian and Palestinian students um, who graduated in Cuba and trained as doctors are also providing assistance to people displaced from Syria in the contemporary situation. We also know that organizations um, such as the OIC, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, and ASEAN have historically had greater access to places like Myanmar than Western actors for a variety of reasons, which can also be explained through South-South cooperation principles. And the potential for those modes of intervention in contexts where otherwise people are going to be um, continuing to be um, without assistance and without access to protection, um, that could possibly provide an, an alternative way of imagining and implementing responses to um, explore different models of response which are more creative and can and ensure greater assistance and protection to people. So we could as almost finishing now, we could see that the West um, has often challenged these alternative modes of response, including Cuba's response as being politically and ideologically motivated rather than motivated by humanitarian principle. We could see the OIC as being identified as a partialist organization which only addresses the needs of Muslim um, people affected by disasters in Muslim majority countries, which are the member states of the, OI of the OIC. But the key question for me is how do people affected by disasters themselves experience, respond to, and conceptualize these different processes and these different modes of response. And that's central to my research on South-South humanitarianism in relation to the Syria context, which is currently funded by the European Research Council. And my final invocation will be to identify, yes, we need to recognise people's experiences of displacement and of disasters. This is essential to be able to identify appropriate modes of response. We need to recognise that people act and that they, they are themselves the first responders in contexts of displacement as individuals, as households, as community members etc. But they are also not just people who can provide us with data for our analyses um, or who can share their perspectives with us on the different um, mechanisms that we're implementing. They conceptualise themselves. They are everyday theorists and they can really enrich our understanding of the ways in which um, responses are developed, have been developed, what the advantages and challenges of those are and what alternative scenarios might exist which would further improve the way that they live today and the way that they uh, and their communities will live in the future. So I apologise for running over but that's my attempt at a forward-looking, positive, upbeat presentation at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you.